Hey, what even is beer? Beer is a complex thing, far more complex than, say, wine. Wine is fruit juice that you stick in a barrel or something and you let it ferment for a few weeks. That's basically it. You can put yeast in it yourself to ferment it, but there's already yeast on the fruit. There's yeast in the air. To make wine, you really just smash up some fruits and wait until the yeast ferment all the sugars into alcohol. That's all. You could think of beer as wine made from grains rather than from fruits. Problem with that is grain doesn't have sugar in it. It has starch, and starches are long chains of sugar that yeast cannot eat. The first thing you need to make beer is malt. I have a whole video about what malt is linked in the description, but here's the short version. Malt is whole grain that you've gotten wet so that it will sprout or start growing into a new plant. When it just starts to grow, it is full of amylase enzymes that will break starches down into sugars. You dry the seeds out to stop them from growing any further, and then you have grains filled with enough enzymes to convert both themselves and even more grains into fermentable sugar. When, you're, when you start talking about how people discovered this, you're getting back into the question of two big early human civilization points of view. That's Dr. Nathan Duncan of Maryville College in Tennessee, where he teaches a chemistry of beer course. This video series is the very short version of that course. The classic point of view has been people started cultivating cereal grains, started making things like bread. Now all of a sudden, you're not relying on constantly searching for food because you can store grain for a long time. And now you have free time, and they started doing things like making beer from it. Those two things always come hand in hand. But then there's other places in the world that, it, that, that we find evidence of fermentation of beer that predate any, any archaeological evidence for our agriculture suggesting that they gathered wild grains, brought them to a place to make beer from it, and then said, hey, this would be a whole lot easier if we started just growing the grains that we want and going from there. Do you realize what this means? This means that in some places at least, people may have invented civilization for the purposes of making beer. Beer is therefore a subject for serious scientific inquiry. That is why Dr. Duncan is getting ready to brew some beers here in the Science Building's outdoor classroom. Assisting him is chemistry major Mackenzie Lamb, who is doing her senior study on brewing. Uh, I'm looking specifically at the bioconversion of terpenes in the fermentation process, which come from the hops that we add to the beer. Yeah, I don't really know what that means either, but this I do understand. This is a recipe for the beer Duncan and Lamb are brewing today. Actually, they're brewing two today. They're brewing an IPA like this, India Pale Ale. It's a light-colored beer, hence the pale. And they're gonna be brewing a Scottish ale like this, which is a darker beer. The difference between this and this, the main difference, is the particular cocktail of grains that they start with. This one, basically, the IPA was basically almost entirely base malt. Specifically this base malt. This is a variety of barley called two-row barley that has been sprouted and then kilned or dried at low temperature. And that's it. That's 88% of the grains in Dr. Duncan's IPA. All beers must have at least some base malt in them. The base malt is key. It's what's going to convert the starches into sugars for the yeast to ferment. However, base malt by itself doesn't taste very interesting, and at worst, it can taste kind of green is the term that they use to describe it. It tastes kind of vegetal. Not a fan. To balance out that flavor, brewers generally include some roasted malt, malt that you have heated until it browns to varying degrees. Roasting the malt destroys the enzymes that would convert the starches into sugar, but it also creates amazing roasty, toasty, nutty flavor notes that to me really define the taste of beer. So for Dr. Duncan's IPA, he's got 88% base malt, malt that has not been roasted at all. And then for the rest of it, he's got some roasted malts, including this one. This is another barley malt called Crystal 20. The number here, this is Crystal 20, 40, 60, and they go up by, by values of 20. The higher that number, the darker, the more caramel-like the flavor is going to be. The remaining malt in the IPA is called Carapils. That's a trademarked name for a light roasted malt made by a proprietary process, and it tastes a lot like grape nut cereal. There's a reason for that. Grape nut cereal contains Carapils malt. <laughs> Yeah, that'd do it, I suppose. The recipe for Dr. Duncan's Scottish Ale is really pretty similar. It's 76% base malt, and then there is some malt that has been smoked or peated. 
We talked about this in the malt video. In Scotland, they historically generated the heat for kilning or roasting malt by burning peat, because they have a lot of peat and not many trees. Burning peat makes a lot of smoke, and depending on how you do it, you can end up getting that smoke on the malt, which gives it a strong smoky flavor. When they say a particular Scotch whiskey is very peaty, that means there's lots of smoked malt involved. Smoked malt is also used in many styles of beer, like porters and stouts. The third malt in Dr. Duncan's Scottish ale is a brand called Carafa. It is a very, very dark roasted malt, similar to this one that he showed me. This one, don't try it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless you want to taste like burnt. This is going to be something that you would use if you're making something like a Guinness Stout. I did taste it, and it tasted like straight espresso beans. Extremely strong stuff. Only 1.7% of the malt in Dr. Duncan's Scottish Ale is going to be that super dark roasted stuff. The difference between a stout like Guinness and a pale ale like Miller Lite, which they have almost the exact same amount of calories, <laughs> is that small percentage of black barley that gives Guinness its dark color. So, the more dark roasted malt in your beer, the darker and nuttier and toastier and roastier the flavor is going to be. But, counterintuitively, they can also make your beer sweeter. The browning reactions that happen in the malt at high roasting temperatures change the sugars in there. The amylase enzymes won't necessarily break them down into glucose because it can't because you've dehydrated some of the oxygens off of the, off of the sugar backbone and it's going to not only not be broken down by the enzymes, but it's also not going to be fermented by yeast. So caramel flavors are going to impart a residual sweetness that will survive the fermentation process. And that's how you get some of those, that malty sweetness that you find in like English brown ales or um, porters. So, back out here in the open air classroom, we've got the malt mixture for the Scottish ale. He has crushed that a little, just cracked open the seeds in a milling machine. Into that goes a little modern technological help, a pH buffer, a substance that will resist changes in acidity and basidity. To keep it in the low pH that's necessary for good starch conversion, we're using some 5.2 stabilizer that'll keep it at the right pH. That's the kind of thing you can obviously brew without, but it makes the results more predictable, the process easier to control. In goes warm water. Enzymes in the base malt are activated by water, and they are most effective at converting starch into sugar at high temperatures. But not too high. Too high a temperature, and you'll cook them. Enzymes are proteins. You will denature them at very high temperatures. You're looking for a sweet spot. You know, 150 to 160 Fahrenheit sweet spot. And so what I'm doing is I'm just kind of stirring it because it's, I mean, if you, you can see how thick this is. Uh, it's not unusual for it to be, when you first add the water, for it to be kind of uneven. So I'm trying to redistribute the heat, but I'm trying to do it kind of quickly to not lose it, because you see that steam coming off. It's definitely cooling off. Once they've got it to a porridge consistency, Duncan will seal it off to preserve the heat in there and start on the IPA. He's pouring hot water into the empty cooler just to temper it, bring it up to temperature, because it's a little cold out here this morning. In goes all that crushed up malt, and then they start stirring in the warm water. You can almost immediately smell, this has that carapils in it. You can almost immediately smell the sweetness from that when that water hits it. I'm gonna smell great going into bio. If you're wondering why they aren't working super clean with hair nets and everything, keep in mind this is gonna get filtered before anyone drinks it and it's gonna get boiled, thereby sterilized. The finished beer will be as safe as I am on the internet thanks to the sponsor of this video, Surfshark. Surfshark is a whole suite of tools you can use to foil hackers and spies and censors and other bad actors on the internet. This suite includes, but is not limited to, Surfshark VPN, the virtual private network. Hit connect on any device and you're routed through one of Surfshark's thousands of encrypted servers all over the world. You can go through two of them if you want. That's called a multi-hop and it's an extra layer of protection. This hides your activity from your ISP or other people on your Wi-Fi network, and you can use it to access content that's only available in some other country. You've also got Surfshark Alert, which can tell you if, say, your credit card number has been compromised somewhere on the internet. There's Clean Web, Surfshark's ad blocker, and there's their own search tool, which won't track your queries and hand them to advertisers. You can save 83% on your unlimited Surfshark membership with my link and code in the description. Use code Adam Ragusea, you'll save 83% and you'll get three months free as well. Thank you, Surfshark. 
Anyway, yeah, they're gonna boil the beer later, but they can't boil it yet. If they did it now, they would denature all of the enzymes that are going to convert all of those starches into sugars for the yeast. In fact, this is looking too hot, so in goes a bunch of cool water to compensate, but not too much because then your mash would be too thin. What they're making here is called a mash, by the way. You don't want it too thick so that you can't dissolve your sugars into it, but you also don't want it so thin that you can't, that the concentration of sugar to, or starch to enzyme is too low too low and there just won't be enough starch floating around in there for the enzymes to convert into sugar. But you can see they've got plenty of starch in there now. See how starchy this is? It's just like white. So cloudy right now. That's all the starch. Yeah. The starch isn't super soluble. In about an hour, what comes out of this is gonna be pretty clear. They've got both mashes sealed up into coolers called tons, mash tons. And now it's time to just wait. We use these igloo coolers because they provide kind of a semi-constant temperature, at least over the one hour duration that it takes to convert all the starches into sugar. Meanwhile, Dr. Duncan will use his turkey fryer burners here to bring some more water up to temperature for the next stage. Hey, what kind of water is that? We have a mountain spring that we go and get water that's from a mountain spring right here in Blount County, Tennessee. This is important. Water is the number one ingredient in the beer by weight and volume. If you use tap water that doesn't taste good, then your beer might not taste good. Plus, if there's chlorine in there that your city puts in the water to sterilize it, it could potentially kill some of the yeast that you're relying on to ferment this. This invites the question, should you use distilled water instead? Then you lose a lot of the minerals that are needed that, for the yeast as well. And also, uh, the water doesn't have the same kind of buffering capacity when it comes to maintaining the proper pH during the mash. Though some brewers do use distilled water as like a blank canvas to which they add back in minerals to achieve certain effects. So if you want to make like a true Pilsner, you can add the right salts to make your water uh, closely mimic that of Pilsen Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic, I guess it is now. Burton water salts mimic the hard water that's at Burton-on-Trent where a lot of English ales originated. And so if you're brewing with your local water, you're making beer that really reflects your local environment. Dr. Duncan says different salts, different ions that are in the water, well, we taste them directly. So it's not just a matter of how they affect the chemistry of the brew. We also just taste them. And other things in here will taste differently in the presence of those minerals. So water is super important. One hour is up, so it's time to connect a little hose to a valve at the bottom of the mash tun and open it up. This is our first runnings off of our mash, and so what I'm doing here is I'm just recirculating it to kind of let the grains that are in there create their own filter bed to block out some of the finer particulates and give us the clearest possible wart that we can get. Wart. There's a typically mellifluous Germanic word. Wart. The name for this sweet liquid that they have made out of grain is wart. And by recirculating some of the wart through the coarse mesh filter at the bottom of this cooler, Dr. Duncan is concentrating the finer particles at the top of the grain bed to make a fine filter. Traditionally, the grain is its own filter, which is another reason why barley is good for making malt and beer. If you saw my malt video, I made malt out of some wheat that I had grown, bread wheat. One feature of wheat that has been bred for bread is that inedible husk or chaff that falls off the grain really easily. That's good for bread, but bad for beer. We need that insoluble fiber to serve as a filter for the wart. Take the alternative to the extreme. Imagine if you made a wart not out of just barely crushed whole wheat barley, but instead you made a wart out of some finely milled refined white flour. That could work if you used malt flour. You could make a wart out of that, but the resulting liquid would be like a, a really thin dough. How on earth would you filter the cloudiness out of that? And that haze is mostly proteins. If you taste what's coming off there now, it's, I mean, it's just what I got on my finger. It's sticky and it tastes like that malt syrup. It doesn't have any starchiness to it at all. Indeed, if you boiled that wort down, you would have malted barley syrup, which is this very tasty stuff that is used in baking, or you can use it directly as a sweetener like honey. Here's the wort for the Scottish ale. Remember, the only difference is the particular cocktail of malt they started with. Now it definitely smells sweet, but you can smell that peat smoke in it. 
This process of draining wort out of the grain bed, this is called lautering, and unfortunately it leaves a lot of good fermentable sugar behind in the grain bed. So to wash some of that good stuff out, you then have to sparge the grain, run fresh hot water over the grains to dissolve as much sugar out of them as you can. Sparging is done lots of different ways. Dr. Duncan is doing a continuous sparging and lautering process here. He's gently sprinkling fresh hot water down through the mash tun at about the same rate at which the wort comes filtering down out of the bottom. The sugars are all moving downward and hopefully the flow rate is faster than diffusion so it doesn't mix it all up as long as it's added gently to the top of the grain. Time to bust out the refractometer and start measuring the sugar content of the wort. Depending on the liquid's specific gravity, light will pass through it differently and you can quantify the sugar content. If the sugars are too concentrated, you lower the efficiency of the whole system. That makes sense, right? Pure water is going to be able to dissolve more sugar out of the grain bed than water that already has a ton of sugar in it. So if the liquid you're passing through the grain is too sweet, you're going to end up leaving lots of good sugar behind, inefficient. On the other hand, if you dilute the liquid too much, the wort simply won't be strong enough and the beer won't be strong enough. Not enough alcohol, not enough anything except for water. And we are at 1.0... Seven, eight, and this beer, this beer's theoretical, should be at about 1.075. Historically, brewers would have judged this by color or taste. If the specific gravity gets too low, if he adds too much water, he could always boil it back out again before the yeast go in, or he could just add sugar. There's my cheat. I'll add extra, just plain dry malt extract. Uh, and I'll get it to the gravity that I want it if I, if I need to. I'm hoping I don't have to use this, but if I do. That extract is pretty cool stuff. It's just the malt barley syrup, but converted into a powder to give it a longer shelf life. We'll take the syrup and they, they, to make that powder, they will freeze spray dry it where they're essentially under a vacuum. They're sprayed in a fine mist and the rest of the water evaporates out of it and it settles as this dust. No such cheating is required today. Duncan has extracted just about all he can from this grain. Historically, this would now have become fertilizer or animal feed. Not even historically, that's <laughs> today. That's what, you know, what does is, what is Budweiser, Miller, any of the major breweries do with their spent grains? They go down the road and they get processed into cattle feed. So now it's time to boil the wort for a while. Brewers do this for a few reasons. They boil to reach the sugar concentration they want. They boil to sterilize the liquid, to kill any microorganisms that could compete with the yeast and make the beer taste bad or even make it dangerous to drink. Boiling also helps to further clarify the wort. The reason Mackenzie has to stir this constantly is it's full of cloudy proteins that'll foam up and boil over if she doesn't break the surface tension through stirring. The proteins are going to denature. That includes the amylase enzymes. And when they do that, they form these clumps because essentially like proteins are strings of amino acids and they're folded into a three-dimensional shape that gives them their function. When they denature, all of those forces break and they basically become a linear strand of just amino acids. And then they clump together and they form this gummy stuff that looks like egg drop soup. In fact, if you make egg drop soup, that's the proteins in the egg whites coagulating. So they'll keep stirring and stirring until they get a good rolling boil and observe what brewers call the hot break. Hot break is that, is that process from when the proteins go from being in solution to coagulating and they come out of solution, they look like little gummy strings that are in there. And those will settle out of the beer and you know, some places might filter them, we'll just let gravity do the work. The last big reason to boil the wort is to extract flavor from supplemental ingredients like hops. Beer does have that residual malty flavor, which is kind of sweet. And so historically, there have been a lot of different herbs and spices that have been used to kind of balance out just that sweetness, just about anything you can think of. So bitter or acidic flavorings like hops work really well. What even are hops? And how do you take this sweet wort and convert it into a frothy, delicious beer? We're gonna talk about all of that in part two. Part two is where the winemaker begins. Winemakers start with a sweet, delicious liquid. We've only now just gotten there with our beer, and we'll take it the rest of the way next time.